David, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Can we start by getting a little bit of background on your role with Kaspersky Lab? It's my pleasure, Steve. Kaspersky Lab is an internet software security company, and I work in the company's global research and analysis team. Thanks, David. Okay, so our topic today is the threat of malware on mobile devices. There have been various warnings about this throughout the last decade, so how's the situation changed now? Yes, you're right. Since the first mobile malware appeared in 2004, there have always been those who have overstated the problem. But equally, there have always been people who have dismissed it as a non-problem. The truth actually lies somewhere in between. By comparison with the deluge of malware we see in general, the volume of mobile malware specifically is just a trickle. It's only really in the last 18 months that cybercriminals have paid serious attention to mobile devices. But right now the threat is real and it's growing quickly. And there are several factors which drive the development of mobile malware. The first is the widespread use of smartphones. The numbers keep going up and up. Second, internet access from a smartphone is now cheaper than ever before. The third reason is that smartphones now hold valuable personal data, like bank information, uh, logins to social networks, things like this, which is all attractive to cyber criminals. And fourth, it's quite common now for people to mix personal and business use. And as a result of that, there's also confidential corporate information, business information, which is attractive to cyber criminals too. Yes, that mixed use can certainly introduce a complexity, particularly in terms of whether the business has any control over the situation. So what does malware on mobile devices do? Are we looking at the same underlying behaviour and objectives as on the desktop, or something different? Yes, we are looking broadly at the same type of behaviour as we see on desktop and laptops. That's really what makes mobile malware so serious. The more we use mobile devices to conduct online transactions, especially financial business, then the more attractive these devices become as a target for cyber criminals. Right now, SMS Trojans are the biggest category of mobile malware. Once they're installed, what these programs do is silently send SMS messages to premium rate or international numbers. We also see banking Trojans that steal financial information specifically, and we see Trojans which steal wider information, social network logins or any other data, uh, so they're less discriminate than the banking Trojans specifically. And what the cyber criminals do off the back of that, of course, is assume our online identity. So how are people likely to come into contact with it? Well, the way people are likely to encounter mobile malware it really varies. Initially, the early malware was spread via Bluetooth, but today it is mainly via the web. So that may mean that somebody simply downloads a program when they happen to be surfing the web. They get it directly, in other words, because they've downloaded it. But equally, it could be indirect. They may respond to a link in an SMS message, for example, or even get a link via a, a QR code, a quick response code. We've become used to cyber criminals making use of social engineering to trick people into downloading code, and it's no different for mobile malware. For example, Trojans may masquerade as a security application, or they may claim to install sexual content on the device. And in some cases, the cyber criminals are really sneaky. What they do is they use search engine optimization techniques to boost where they come in the search rating, if you like. So they bump themselves up the listing to the top of the search engine result. However, mobile malware isn't just found on random websites. Cyber criminals also distribute their code via legitimate app stores. For example, we've seen malware in the Android marketplace. It's important to say that for a malicious mobile app to run, it does require permission to your device. You've got to download it, you've got to run it, and you've got to give it permission to do the things it needs to do to operate. So we should all pay very close attention to the things that an app asks to do. For example, if an app asks for permission to access your contacts list, but actually its advertised functionality has nothing to do with messaging, you should be very suspicious. What you mentioned earlier on there about QR codes is interesting, because they're certainly creating a culture of getting people to scan them without actually being able to check what they're linking to, unless, of course, their app tells them before actually making the link. Have there been any examples of them being misused in this way? 
Yes, that's the crux of the problem. You can't see what you're linking to, so it's effectively a leap in the dark. And QR codes are becoming very popular. That's hardly surprising because it's a much easier way of getting access to something. It's easier to scan a QR code than it is to manually type in a URL. Okay, so going back to the more general issue, do you have any feel for the volume or proportion of mobile devices that get infected as a result of these new mobile strains? To what extent is this sort of malware actually there in the wild? Well, right now there are more than 4,000 mobile malware signatures in the Kaspersky Lab database, and it's growing faster than at any time since malicious programs for mobile devices first appeared. The volume doubled, in fact, in 2011. Most of the malware we've seen so far either is or has been found in the field. So this is clearly far fewer signatures than we see even in a single day for malware targeting the desktop operating systems. What are the chances of actually coming across it in practice? Do you see the situation escalating more rapidly now? You're right, it's much less common than malware targeting Windows, for example. Currently, we see more than 70,000 unique samples every day overall, and we create 3,500 new signatures every day. So, numerically at least, it's a trickle compared to the wider torrent of malware as a whole. And we're all less likely to encounter mobile malware than we are malicious programs for the desktop and the laptop. Nevertheless, the rate of growth, especially in the last 12 months or so, is worrying. And, of course, the more we use our smartphones, and increasingly they're always on, the more mobile malware we're likely to see. The numbers, actually, are comparable to the rate of growth of malware for PCs at a similar stage of development. In other words, after five or six years of uh, PC malware, we were at about the same place we are now with mobile malware. Are some of the platforms safer than others? For example, what are the relative risks for users on Android, BlackBerry, iOS and Windows Phone? Windows dominates on desktops and laptops. However, things are different on mobile devices. The market is very fragmented at the moment. So, until the middle of 2011, most mobile malware was Java-based. This was the only way cyber criminals could deliver code that would run on multiple platforms. However, the rapidly growing market share of Android has made this a very attractive target for malware writers. And it's in fact now the biggest category of mobile malware that we see. However, market share is not the only factor affecting development of malware. The market approach taken by a platform vendor is also important. To give you an example, the Android operating system is no less secure per se than, for example, iOS, which is on Apple devices. However, Android provides a very open environment for developers of apps, and this has led to a large and diverse selection of apps available. Also, there's no restriction on where people can download apps from. So this increases the risk of rogue apps being downloaded. Finally, the person using the device is responsible themselves for deciding the permissions on the device. For example, if an app can access SMS or contacts. By contrast, iOS is a closed, restricted file system, allowing the download and use of apps from just a single source, in other words, the App Store. This means a lower security risk. Because in order to distribute code, a would-be malware writer would have to find some way of sneaking code into the App Store. Of course, if someone decides to jailbreak or root their device, this unlocks it and bypasses the restrictions of the operating system. And in this case, all bets are off, so to speak. To date, the only malicious code we've seen for iOS targets jailbroken devices. We have seen malware for other platforms too, Symbian, Windows Mobile and BlackBerry, but a much smaller quantity compared to the cross-platform Java malware or the malware which is targeting the Android platform. So Apple's closed approach with iOS has received a fair bit of criticism from some quarters, but it would seem to be offering a tangible advantage in this context. I'd say it is, but I think I'd have to qualify that by saying, for now. There have already been reported cases of undesirable apps being posted to the App Store, although not malware per se. Online app stores are not managed by security experts, remember. The fact that software carries a tacit stamp of approval just because it's available in a legitimate app store could actually work in favour of malicious apps in the future. It's a bit like a dangerous appliance carrying a British standards kite mark. Okay, so who's producing this malware? Is it the same people as producing the traditional strains? 
Well, it's hard to know exactly who develops the code itself because the coder may not be the person or group using the code. The purpose of most mobile malware to make money from their victims makes it clear that mobile malware is part of this wider dark market. In that case, it's very similar to, let's say, the Windows platform. So within this dark market, are we seeing any malware or scams that are targeting both desktops and mobiles as part of the same overall attack? Unfortunately, yes, we are. There are two specific threats, known as Zeus in the mobile and SpyEye in the mobile, and these are purpose-built to work in tandem with their PC counterparts. They target banks that use mobile phones for two-factor authentication of bank transactions. Here's how it works. The idea is that you get an SMS message which contains a one-time code that supplements your static bank password. The PC malware tries to actually use this mechanism and subvert it. So what the malware on the PC does is create a, a sophisticated phishing scam that tries to trick you into disclosing your mobile number. So they paste their own HTML over the bank's legitimate web page. Then the cyber criminals send a message to your phone once they've got your number, and this message contains a link. And if you click on it, and it's a phishing message, just as you'd expect on the PC, it installs mobile malware. From then, every time you carry out a bank transaction, the bank's legitimate SMS code is sent automatically and silently to the cyber criminals who then masquerade as you. So in other words, they're trying to own both devices in parallel and use them both to subvert the bank's security mechanisms. Right, so many internet security vendors, including yourselves, now have AV products for mobile devices. To what extent are these being used? Are we having to relearn lessons that should already have been learnt from the PC era? Use of security products for mobile devices is growing as people gradually become aware of the potential threat. And in addition, we're starting to see a move towards security products that include protection for all the devices a person has, the desktop, the laptop and mobile devices, so that they can be protected across the board. So how does this work? Are we talking about using the desktop PC to scan other devices? No. You buy a single box, and this box contains separate installations for your PC, your smartphone, your tablet, or you have one license that covers you to do multiple downloads from a vendor's website. Okay, so thinking a bit more widely then, what about the threats beyond malware? To what extent are mobile devices and their users being exposed to other types of attack? Well, cyber criminals have adopted a steal-everything approach. In other words, they harvest personal data, data of all kinds, not just the obviously financial data like bank logins or passwords. At the same time, of course, people are storing more and more data on their smartphones. And the mix of personal and business use on a device means that this data may be confidential corporate information. The more we use smartphones, particularly for financially related activities, the more of a target they are likely to become. And that's why it's important that we all password protect our devices, encrypt the data on them, and also, of course, protect against malware. Now, you mentioned password protecting devices, and we know from our research that use of passwords and pins is far from uniform on mobiles. And I'd suspect that use of encryption is even less so, especially outside of organisations. Now, is this an option that's available as standard on the devices? Most devices allow you to control access to the device itself using a PIN, but of course this may be limited to just four numbers. And to go beyond this and encrypt the data stored on your device, you probably do need a third-party app. That's why, before you invest in an antivirus program for your device, check with the vendor to make sure that it also includes extra functionality like encryption, like data blocking, like remote data wiping and more. Do you think that users think about their devices in the right way? Certainly from past research that we did in Plymouth, they seem not to appreciate the significance of what they were carrying around in terms of sensitive data or the resulting need to protect the device through things like using authentication. Yes, I think that perception certainly plays a part in security. These things started out as mobile phones, and actually we still think of them as phones. We call them phones, even though we add the adjective smart at the beginning of that. But these days, they're much more than phones. They're actually sophisticated computers. 
The problem is the functionality of smartphones beyond voice, beyond SMS, has crept up on us slowly. It's developed organically, so to speak, behind the scenes. And this has security implications because if you don't perceive as a phone, as a computer, then the potential security risks related to that computer in your pocket or in your bag isn't immediately obvious. So with all of this in mind, what would be your key advice to mobile users that want to protect their devices and their data when they're on the move? Well, my first piece of advice would be to urge people to remember that what you have in your bag or your pocket is a computer and security is just as important as it is for your desktop or your laptop. Second piece of advice would be this. It's important to realize that security means more than just anti-malware protection. You should use a password, you should encrypt your data, and you should really consider a security application that includes the ability to block access to the data if you lose it or it gets stolen, or even wipe the data completely. Okay, I think that about wraps us up for now. David, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. It's my pleasure, Steve.